Okay. <coughs> I, last time I forgot to mention one important uh, result, which is a corollary again of the following theorem I proved last time. G compact A group and <coughs> T in G a torus then given any X in G which commutes with all of T there is a torus T prime containing T as well as X. This was proved using <coughs> the fact that the mapping x to x power n is a subjective map of g to into itself. We can compute the degree of the map x to x power n, show that it is not 0 and therefore g to g raising to the power n is uh, subjective. That is how it is proved. Anyway, I will not go back to the proof of that. But the one corollary, I drew other corollaries, but this corollary I forgot to state. It says the following. If G compact connected Simple. if <coughs> G is above if uh, yes is any torus in G the centralizer of S in G is connected. Let me give it a name centralizer of uh, centralizer ZS of S and G is connected ZS set of G in G GS equal to SG for every S in S. <coughs> It is immediate from this because you pick an element in the centralizer, it commutes with this and therefore there is a torus containing both and the torus is commutative therefore it is in the centralizer of S. So the entire torus in the centralizer of S and contains S therefore it is connected, <coughs> ZS is connected. Okay, that is one thing I forgot to mention last time and I stated the following theorem of Brewer it's the following M N compact manifolds of the same dimension D C <coughs> and F to M, M to N, smooth map, uh, M N compact oriented manifolds, oriented smooth manifolds, F M to N uh, <coughs> oriented, uh, M to N a smooth map. and n, n, n be a point such that I did not state this theorem this fashion, I stated it somewhat differently but now this is the precise statement I will need presently. So n, n, n be a point such that F inverse N is 
is a finite set is finite and for every m in f inverse n <coughs> the differential map df from the tangent space at p at, at m to tangent space at n T of the <coughs> yeah. it's an isomorphism. Then degree of F equals some m in f inverse n sin of uh, determinant df. Now to talk of determinant one needs uh, a basis of the tangent space here and the tangent space here and that basis or will give you an orientation. The basis will give you an orientation on both sides. And with respect to the basis, if you write the matrix, if you write, the, write the matrix and I can talk of determinant of df. And that's what I mean here. So see the local behavior near a fiber determines the degree completely. So sine determinant df, this determinant sine is either plus 1 or minus 1. So you add up those things and that is, <coughs> sorry, determinant of df at m, sorry, sine, sine of determinant, m is an f inverse, sorry, no, small n, small n instead of capital small m. Small n. Small n. Oh, this? No, no, this is okay. F inverse, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, thank you. you know, oh, just one point. So, the behavior in the inverse image of one point. Does manifold is connected or? Sorry, all, all, yeah, yeah, sorry. Manifold is connected. Both the M and N are compiled. Otherwise, degree does not make sense. I, do, I do not have a fundamental class otherwise. Okay. Degree, remember, is. equals uh, the no, f induces mapping h d f from h d m to h d n and this has an identification with z by our orientation and similarly, similarly here z and this you get a certain number here which is the degree any mapping of z to z is multiplication by some integer and that is the degree. <coughs> so in order to be able to say some mapping is subjective for instance you use the fact that degree is non-zero and the degree can be computed by what happens in just over one fiber if this condition is satisfied. This automatically means of course that there is a neighborhood of uh, n in n such that the inverse image of that neighborhood breaks up into disjoint union of open sets each one corresponding to each n and on each of them the mapping is a homeomorphism that comes from the inverse function theorem because df is non-singular so it comes from the inverse function theorem. <coughs> okay, so this is the uh, Brouwer's theorem. Brouwer has a remarkably large number of beautiful theorems <coughs> all in the beginnings of algebraic topology. Anyway, so and later of course uh, many of you would know he turned to intuitionism. In fact, he was one of the originators of what is called intuitionism. 
uh, system of logic which uh, more or less excludes practically all arguments we normally use when dealing with uh, infinite objects, all limit processes and so on. For instance, for, uh, for Brewer, a uh, number on the real line is defined only if you can give a, an algorithm to say what the nth decimal place of it is for instance. So in other words, you will be able to determine in finite time what the nth decimal place is. You have to give a, that only such numbers are numbers for him, which of course would preclude many of his own proofs of theorems <laughs> in topology, but there it is. <coughs> anyway, <coughs> all right, so that is, now I am going to use this theorem to prove the following statement. Let us look at the mapping g cross t, t fix the maximal torus. T in G. Consider the map G cross T to T. Now, namely, oh sorry, G cross T to G. Namely, G comma T goes to G T G inverse. That is the mapping of G cross T to G. And this factors through the claim is theorem, let us call this map phi, phi is subjective. Suppose I am able to prove this, then that will mean given any element of G, it is it can be conjugated into the maximal torus. Every element is con can be conjugated into maximal torus. If you add this theorem, of course, the earlier theorem that uh, the mapping x to x power is subjective is immediate. But now we have to turn it on. We are using the fact to prove first of all that any element is contained in a torus and now I am saying that any g, any, any element of g actually has to conjugate in some maximal torus. It is obvious from this because you take an element psi you then find you can find a g such if you take any element uh, psi you can find a g you can find a something in the torus such that psi is g g t g inverse for some t in t so this will prove so let me draw the corollary before i prove that statement every element x in g has a conjugate in t. The set of elements which has a conjugate in t is immediately is obviously the image of phi and once phi is subjective then every element has a conjugate in t that is clear. So, the second corollary, which is a corollary of the first corollary, if you like, if any two, any torus S of G has a conjugate in T, why use the fact that S, any S is the closure of a group generated by a single element theta. You know every torus has a generator that is the Kronecker theorem it is a, it's a cyclic group generated by a suitable element is dense in that. Now theta has a conjugate in T 
because we have every element as a conjugation T. So there exists alpha in G such that alpha theta alpha inverse is in T, which implies alpha S alpha inverse is in T. So every torus is a maximum, every torus is a conjugate in T in particular, every maximal torus is a conjugate in T and therefore all maximal tori are conjugates. So the common rank of these tori is called the rank of the group G. Sorry, this is common dimension. Of this story is the rank So it is simply defined as the dimension of, max, of, a, of a maximal torus because all maximal torus are conjugates. <coughs> so right. <coughs> now how, how, how does the proof of that theorem go? It has this. First, I observe that G mod T has a natural structure let me first we know that G has a natural structure. an oriented manifold. Why? Because we know the, if you look at the, let us look at the tangent space to G at E. Then let X1, X2, Xn be a basis. of T E G. If I now left translate all this for every G in G, look at this left translate of S G F X I. Then you look at let me denote omega G to be the element L G X1 so ordered basis. L G X one, it should be L G X two, L G of X. This gives you at every point in the tangent space an element in the nth exterior power, which is non zero, because X one X is the basis and obviously depends analytically on the parameter on G. So this shows omega g, omega, the collection omega g, g in g gives a orient, gives an orientation on g. Let us now, uh, let L be the rank of g and we assume this base is so chosen, assume X1 extra XL to be a basis of the tangent space at E or to the torus T. So, it, so what I have done is to take a basis for the tangent space to T which is the Lie algebra of T and that is a sub algebra of G and complete it to a basis in some way. Then I automatically get 
so let me call this omega sub g get orientation omega t on t so an orientation omega t on t and an orientation g now look at the space the space g mod t i claim it's a compact space has a natural structure of an analytic manifold okay this is something more general g is a compact group g in fact g is a linearly group and h is a subgroup a close subgroup which is then a for lie group then g mod h becomes a manifold in a natural fashion i will prove it in this case but the proof is entirely analogous there's no uh, difference when you take more general situation of lie group and a close subgroup why is this sorry more general setup also it's analytic g yeah 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 if g is a lie group it has analytic structure h is a close subgroup it has analytic structure and g mod h has analytic structure the proof is quite easy it goes like this <coughs> the first remark is that to take g be the lie algebra of g and let us not be h or rather t the lie sub algebra corresponding to t now let v be a linear subspace of g such that g equals the direct sum of t and v there is always a supplementary subspace v to any subspace so look at this decomposition consider the map g to g which are called script t uh, defined by e of x y this x is in g is of all the direct sum so i can write any element as a pair like this x y and this is in v so exponential of x into exponential of y different the map like this <coughs> then what happens is this you can easily check you know what what is the differential of this map so what uh, it's a ma- you look at the map this is got by taking g cross g and then i'm just going to restrict it to you have this uh, subspace t cross v sitting inside g cross g and from here you have the mapping x cross x into g cross g <coughs> and then the multiplication m we know that this exp- i'm going to if i identify i identify the tangent space of g with the lie algebra g itself we know that this mapping at the at the tangent tangent map of this is a map from g cross g to g cross g this is nothing but <coughs> identity cross identity that's what this the tangent map is and from here the map is xy going to or x plus y so now if i compose all the way from t cross v to g 
this is a linear inclusion so x y will go into x y and after this it goes into x plus y which is x y pair. So this is the identity map. So this mapping is also <coughs> at the tangent level an isomorphism and therefore by the inverse function theorem there is a neighborhood in which things behave. So there exists u in open containing 0 in T and V containing 0 in sorry and V uh, this V is bad notation okay right here omega omega prime in containing 0 in V such that the map x y going to expect x y is an analytic isomorphism onto an open set in G. So you have this mapping at the tangent level the mapping is the identity and therefore <coughs> you find that by the inverse function theorem there is a you have an open neighborhood it is an analytic isomorphism of omega cross omega prime. Okay. Now clearly which way is it I think I will put x t in the, on the left hand side okay. So you find that now you look at g mod t let me write it on the <coughs> I am going to write it on the left side left hand side. Now the thing is that uh, had I interchanged the roles of these two it would have come on the right hand side I would have written g mod t it makes no difference I look at g mod t now and look at the mapping which takes our omega no not omega our omega prime to under exp it goes into g and then go to it is easy to check that this map this induces an isomorphism of omega prime a homeomorphism of omega prime on an open set in g mod t. The point is you look at omega prime and look at its image and then omega prime times t is the saturation of omega prime that in the quotient space again yeah that in the quotient space gives you an open set by the re definition of the quotient topology. On g mod when is the set open here set is open if its image inverse image is open. Now if you take omega prime omega prime times t t is simply trans number of translates omega prime are translated by elements of t. So omega prime t is first of all same as <coughs> I am doing it on the left sorry t omega prime t omega prime is same as v x p times omega prime then again applying t x p, x p times omega prime is already an open set. And if I apply t t contains x p so if I apply t it is it is get the saturation and it is a translate a number of open sets therefore it is open union of translates therefore it is open. So, it is therefore the image of omega prime here is it's an open set. I now declare no, so, get, so get a chart on you get a chart namely omega image of omega prime 
phi omega prime and the inverse of that map phi inverse. That is an open set in Euclidean space. Omega prime after all is a sub open set in the Z sub, Z sub algebra sorry in, in V, V is a vector space and so what you get is a chart, a coordinate chart. Now if I choose a another point in G mod T, now consider the collection G uh, omega prime G and then <coughs> yeah right RG inverse composite pi. Pi omega prime. Pi omega prime G is going to be open set because pi omega prime is an open set in G mod T and I am translating it some some element G in G. So this is going to be an open set in G mod T. And then I apply right translation the, on this the group G operates on the right and I look look at RG inverse apply to this that will get me to pi omega prime and then pi makes sense pi composed with that. So this is obviously going to be homeomorphism. So this is another chart you get get a family of consider a collection of charts given by this claim this gives you an atlas, analytic atlas. Basically because of the fact that the group itself multiplication by G inverse, right multiplication by G inverse is an analytic map and then it is easy to see that this works. So that gives you makes that into a manifold, analytic manifold. So this is the structure of analytic manifold on G mod T. The same thing can be done with for writing T on the right side. So in fact from now on I will say the structure on G mod T. I am more used to writing T on the right hand side, so I will stick with this. <coughs> okay, so that gives you the analytic structure, and then I want to say it is also orientable. Once again, the point is that <coughs> if I fix G being connected uh, <coughs> no, once again let us let's see, fix the basis of G starting with X1, X2, XL uh, basis of G. XL in T of T and XL plus one tetra XN a basis of V. Now look at this image XL plus one etcetera XN is then a basis for the tangent space at the identity coset (coughs) 
of g mod t. Uh, after all, the, see this, we saw that omega prime maps homeomorphically onto g mod t and the tangent space at any point of omega prime in particular at that entry is nothing but v. And I am looking at the image of v in the, I am thinking of this as Euclidean, as Euclidean space and then the image of v will be the tangent space here and that has the basis x1 x2 xl. So you can look at xl plus 1 x0 xl let's the image of this let me call this uh, xl plus 1 bar etc xn bar. So xl, XL plus 1 etc xn bar will be a non-zero element of the tangent space to g mod t at e. The supplementary thing is what goes into the total tangent space of the quotient space g mod t. Okay, I mean, <coughs> and now I, what I will do is to, on the g mod t, I know g operates on the left. So you can look at, and of course, uh, from the definitions, it is clear the mapping g cross g mod t to g mod t, left multiplication by g is going to be analytic from the definitions it is easy to see. <coughs> and now look at, so this is multiplication, look, look at the left translation by g, g the left translation by g induces a map in the tangent space dg if you like differential of g is a mapping of the tangent space at e. At, at the at the coset et <coughs> to the coset at the tangent space at gt and this dg will take this element let me call this element alpha let me just call that element so dg look at dg of alpha that gives me an element in the tangent, so d, sorry, dg of alpha gives me an element in, alpha is an element here, sorry, dg, sure. now I look at exterior, this n minus l of t and my alpha is an element here and when I applied dg gives me an element here in exterior n minus l t of gt at this point so let us this is alpha g let me call it alpha g yeah. now two elements g1 g2 may take these things into the same element if they differ by element on the right by t g1 g1 and g1 t will give you the same element here when I whether the class set by G or G T for T in T you get the same element which means I when I do that a priori I get two different elements but I want to say I get the same element. The reason is that <coughs> the claim is alpha G depends only on G T. on the coset gt that is if I modify in other words alpha g is same as alpha gt for every t in t. The point is that uh, when you are <coughs> in other words what I want to say is that at the identity element itself that if you translate by t the element is fixed t of et mm. is et limit fixed and therefore the tangent space is fixed where maps into itself and the induced map 
the nth exterior power is easily checked is the identity map. Basically because the point is that uh, you get, so what you get is a mapping of T, get T into the automorphisms of the exterior, this is a one dimensional space, exterior T, E T, N minus L. You get mapping of T into this, okay. And at ideal T, you get the identity map. When you take the element 1 in T, the image is 1. And this is a continuous map. Look at the determinant of what happens here. You get not determinant of T. So you get this map phi, look at determinant phi T. Determinant phi T is going to be a continuous homomorphism of T into that into automorphisms one dimension into R star. Okay. T is connected. R star is a and phi of 1 goes into 1 and therefore the whole thing has to go into R plus. In fact, the whole thing has to go into 1 because T is compact. Phi T everything goes into 1. So you get a so called is the, by the way the uh, the highest exterior power of the tangent space, the elements you get are sometimes called volume forms or rather they are the dual of volume forms but anyway I will call them volume forms. So you do get a everywhere non-zero volume form which means manifold is orientable. Okay. And so what happens next? So I, I made this G mod T into an orientable oriented manifold. In fact, if I fix the way I fix the basis, I get a definite orientation. So G mod T has become an oriented manifold. G already has been made into an oriented manifold and also T. They are all three of them oriented manifolds. And you have this mapping G cross T to T which factors through G over T to T, cross T to T. You get a mapping of G over T cross T to G. Now these are both manifolds of the same dimension because G over T, G has dimension N means and T has dimension L. So this has dimension, whatever this, this has dimension <coughs> N and this is dimension N minus L plus L which is N. These are both manifolds of the same dimension and we also both are oriented. <coughs> now, let us see what happens to the fiber over a good point in for this map over a good point in G. So, I have this mapping G mod T cross T to G. <coughs> and now fix an element theta in T to be a generator. How will you get points in the inverse image? I call this mapping pi. Pi inverse theta will consist of points G, T, comma, what should I call it, theta prime with the property with such that G, this collection of G, T, theta prime with the condition that G inverse theta prime <coughs> G equals theta. G inverse theta prime G is really independent of uh, the choice of the element inside the coset because if we modify by T, T sorry which way is it theta, theta prime. If I modify by T, T commutes with theta. So I am going to get the same element on this side. So this is size of the fiber, which is which says that uh, how, do, how do so you want this means this implies first of all if this condition implies that G inverse T G which way is it G T 
g inverse sorry g inverse theta prime g 1 pair such so that g theta prime g inverse equals theta ok. <coughs> g theta prime g inverse theta pi inverse theta is a set of points g t theta prime such that oh yeah theta prime is sorry theta prime is also in the torus theta prime is in the torus so theta prime in t. So what happens is g conjugates the torus the gen, the, the, so the, theta prime theta prime is the torus and g conjugates that into theta. But theta being a generator, it means this is a generator of g inverse tg and therefore g inverse tg prime tg must be equal to t. This implies theta prime is a generator of the torus g inverse theta g on the other hand theta prime is in T which implies G inverse T G equals T. Theta prime <coughs> is that clear? Huh? Okay. You have necessarily G, G inverse T G equal to T that is G must be in normal as of T. And we have seen that nt by t is a finite group. So the elements, so the fiber of uh, pi over theta is a finite set. bijective with W. So, this is exactly, exactly one point for each W and W you get the inverse point in the inverse image. Namely, you take W inverse theta. W. <coughs> so, and now here is some point theta and I took the inverse image. So, theta prime and now, if I'm, I show that the tan, tangent map, there is some tangent map at that point. You show that the tangent map is at, uh, obviously tangent is mapping is non singular, and you have to show that we have also orientations on both. And one one shows it's it's, it's uh, not too difficult to compute computation to see that the tangent map is always a positive determinant. We have fixed orientations, and therefore. It makes sense to talk as a determinant, and the determinant has the same sign everywhere. In fact, it is all the time the same value at all the points, determinant. And therefore, the degree is W, number of elements in W is the degree. So, degree of the map, tangent map has the same determinant at all theta in the fiber which implies degree of phi of pi equals the cardinality of w. Well, it is not equal to 0 if the group T, I mean it is it is it, it, trivial if the group T is a, uh, G itself is abelian if it is a torus. So, we are if it is a torus there is nothing to prove. If, if it is a torus T mod T, as our statement is G mod T cross T to T is subjective that is trivial to prove uh, T is <coughs> abelian. I mean if, if G is abelian, if G is not abelian this argument to work, work through. <coughs> so, I missed something. Why can't pi inverse theta be 
Theta itself is there. E e e t theta. Okay. Where is some generator? E theta in e inverse is theta. The fiber fiber is non empty because it contains the identity element, identity coset, comma theta itself. Still something is no, bugging you. you No, no. For, for theta, I found an inverse image. But theta is just practically no, no. Huh? But theta is practically any element. Theta okay. is an element of the torus. Oh, only, only for the torus. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, theta is an element. It's the generator of the torus. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, otherwise, you can't you can't be sure that uh, it's in the image yet. No. So the degree is positive. The degree is non-zero, and therefore it follows that mapping is subject. And then the two corollaries are immediate. The two corollaries immediately come through because I've proved those corollaries already. There is a variation of this proof again using topology, which uses a so-called <coughs> left side fixed point theorem. This is the proof given by Andre Weyl. This proof I, I do not know where I picked it up from, I do not know who it is due to, uh, but you know it is the two proofs are more or less similar, there is nothing really point. You look at the space G mod T and then you take an element G in G, you want to prove <coughs> that uh, G acting on G mod T has a fixed point. If I do that for any g in g, look at the action of g on g mod t, what does it mean? To say it is a fixed point is to say g h t equals h t, which means h inverse g h is going to be in t. Sorry. So, H inverse GH is in T. So, it, you have to prove it is a fixed point. And there is the famous left side fixed point theorem which tells you that <coughs> take the induced map, left side fixed point theorem says the following. Let X be a finite simplicial complex. Any it turns out that any analytic manifold has a triangulation and therefore has a structure of a simplicial complex. Well, that is a fairly deep result, but which I did not want to use. So that is why I fell back on Brower. So and f x to x be a continuous map. The left side the number of f number of f is the sigma minus 1 power i trace h i x is a finite simple complex. So, you can write infinity, but it will terminate at some point. Look at the h i f is a mapping of So the trace makes sense. It's a finite. All these cohomologies are finite. Homologies are finite. So the trace makes sense. And take the alternating sum of the traces. Then that number is called the left side number. 
and the theorem of left set this let's call this left set number LF. If LF is non zero, this has a fixed point, F has a fixed point that is a point X in X such that FX equals X. Okay. For example, the broad fixed point term is a special case. You would look at the any map of the simplex into itself or the equilibrium disk into itself. Simplex is a triangulation of the <coughs> disk. Take a mapping of the disk into itself. The any map is homotopic to the identity map, to the constant map in fact and any two maps are homotopic. So the identity map, the any map f therefore induces the identity map on all the homologies. The trace of the identity is the rank of the homology group. So identity map on itself. So alternate some of the traces is the Euler characteristic in this case. And the Euler characteristic for a disk is not zero because H naught is R and all higher dimensional homologies are zero. So the alternating sum is not zero. So you get the borough fixed point theorem. The left such number of any map is non zero. So any map has a fixed point on the, the disk, the case of disk. So the borough fixed point theorem is a special case of the Lipschitz fixed point theorem. Anyway, that is uh, all that must really be treated as an aside. So if uh, what one does is to do look at G mod T <coughs> and then you look at, oh yeah, you have to, there is some, something more to be said anyway, G mod T to G mod T you have the mapping LG, left multiplication by G. This, so you would like, if I can prove that the left set number of this is not 0, then I am done. But the left set number of this is the same as the left set number of the identity map or left set number of any 2 G is the same because any 2 can be connected with an arc which gives you a homotopy between LG and LG prime. G and G prime are two elements connect them by an arc G T and then L G T gives you homotopy between L G and L G prime. So any, any map is homotopic and then what happens is this you apply this in the special case theta by theta generator of T. If theta is generator of T you find that the fixed points of theta are precisely the cosets correspond to the value group elements Wt will be the cosets. And then once again you have a local global version of uh, the left set number that you can compute the left set number of a map by knowing what happens near the various fixed points just at the fixed point. It is basically same kind of something, something like the Brouwer theorem will have to be come into play. And then you find you get the same number everywhere. So for the, it turns out for the generating element theta, the left size number can be computed by looking at the local behavior of the fixed point. There are only the fixed points are finite in number, and there what you have to do is it's a little more complicated. You have to take the differential. If it's a, if it's a fixed point, theta fixes that point and therefore induces a map in the tangent space. You call it d theta, and then you have to take the determinant of d theta minus i, minus identity element. That is the in the local index at that point. If you add up the local indices, you get the left side index at any good point. At, sorry, for, for any one good transformation like L theta, you can compute the left side number by looking at what happens at, at the fixed points. There are only finite number of fixed points. I just have to see what the differential at those finite number of fixed points is. It looks, it's a, it is essentially the same as the other proof which is why I did not want to go into it but I, it is good to know this proof as well. 
ओके सो या ओके नाउ we saw last time also i mentioned this g a compactly group connected it's not necessary but let me assume anyway connectedly group then one has a faithful finite dimensional representation for some n i proved it or at least stated it last time it uh, hinges on the fact that uh, there is a neighborhood identity which contains no subgroup whatever neighborhood identity in any lie group which does not contain any subgroup <coughs> any finite subgroup that's a statement okay so sigma g to g and c this is a faithful representation then sigma decomposes we know that from general compact lie compact group theory we know that sigma decomposes a direct sum of irreducible representations actually we know that g admits a unitary irreducible representation for the u and namely there's a inner product which is left invariant in this on cn and so you can assume that it goes into u and so sigma i direct sum of uh, irreducible unitary representations now let's see what happens to <coughs> so sigma is a faithful representation means sigma for every uh, for every x not equal to 1 sigma x is not equal to 1. i interchange e and 1 interchange often sometimes i write one sometimes i write e so this decomposes sigma is a direct sum of sigma i all unitary representations now sigma i being irreducible implies let's let denote by let c be the center it's obviously a closed subgroup and therefore the subgroup the group in its own right and sigma is irreducible implies sigma i c is contained in sigma i sorry sigma i of c is contained in that that's so called true schema if you have an irreducible representation and if you have transformation which commutes with every element of the group acting on that then the transformation is be scalar and so it, here it must be in the first fall an element of c star but then it's a compact group so so the whole thing goes into a compact group sigma c is a compact group sigma c goes into a compact group only compact subgroup of c star the max there's a unique maximal compact subgroup c star namely circle group so it has to go into the circle group so let's call this sigma c now look at let me talk, call chi i g2 uh, s1 be the homomorphism g 
g going to determinant sigma i g. Determinant is a homomorphism from g l n or u n into the circle and therefore if I compose this sigma i with the determinant I get a homomorphism of g into s1 and what is the kernel? Let us look at the direct sum of the chi i's that is a mapping of g into s1 cross s1 cross s1 certain number of copies i say 1 less than root i less than root then would mean this n copies. <coughs> chi i is a mapping of g to s1 cross s1. Now I claim that uh, chi i suppose if x is in x is in c chi i x equal to 1 that is I look at the kernel of chi i <coughs> for every i. So which is the same thing as the kernel of the direct sum of direct sum of these representations. So look at this set let us call this f. I say f is a finite group <coughs> because what happens is this on the, on the center it is a you get the sigma i c sigma i restricted to c is a homomorphism say alpha i from c to s1 <coughs> and chi i then chi, chi i restricted to c is nothing but alpha, alpha i power n i where n i is the dimension of the representation sigma i. When you take the scalar matrix its determinant is simply the dimension the, the, the scalar raised to the dimension of the vector space. So you find that chi i restricted to c is alpha i. From all this I claim and it is easy to see that pi chi i kernel so from all this you see that kernel of pi chi i sorry direct sum chi i restricted to c restricted to c equals sorry is finite. You do not, yeah. Why chi i is to c is alpha i power n i? Uh, kernel of pi chi i, you see, uh, 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 the point is chi i is, oh, sorry, I should have said kernel of pi chi i g to c i, where is it? Oh, this is, should be alpha i. Sorry. <coughs> kernel of See alpha i is the character, sigma i is related to c is a homomorphism of alpha i c to s1 and chi i is alpha i power n. I want to say that the kernel of alpha i is, uh, no actually kernel of pi alpha i is, is trivial first of all. Because the, uh, the kernel of the various sigma i if I take their intersection is trivial and sigma i when restricted to <coughs> g is nothing but restricted restricted to is nothing but alpha i it is scalar alpha i. So therefore the, the kernel of pi alpha i restricted to c is trivial and which implies kernel of pi direct sum of chi i is finite because each chi i is some power of alpha i after all. So if chi i, look, look at something in the kernel of chi i, all the chi i, then they are each chi i is some power of alpha i say n, n i power of alpha i, then it means the element x 
I mean, I apply alpha I x, it, power n i will be 0, will be 1. So that is true for every n i and you, <coughs> which will mean that it is element of the elements you get in the kernel are all of orders divisible by n1 times n2 to nr which and therefore it is finite in the product of the anyway. So this implies and in fact we have the following we look at the determinant sigma i g this uh, chi i is a home of some from g to s1. So the kernel chi i contains the commutator subgroup bracket g g for every i. So intersection kernel chi i equals is contains bracket g g. On the other hand let us see this uh, sigma i induces homomorphism from the Lie algebra g into <coughs> the matrix m n i okay you get Lie algebra homomorphism and therefore from the direct sum to the direct sum of this you get Lie algebra homomorphism. Now on the other hand this is a faithful representation and if I go to from this you go apply the trace which is the which is the differential of the of the de determinant homomorphism and that goes into so many copies of C and here it is pi sig sigma i dot I should write and here you get chi i G to M and C, you have this mapping G to C. <coughs> and one sees from this, it is not difficult to see from this that uh, this kernel chi i dot equals bracket g g. See the point is that uh, the <coughs> you, your original representation sigma i is faithful, so direct sum of sigma i is faithful on g and whereas the chi i vanishes uh, on bracket g g. From that it is easy to see that this is true. So the what I want to say is the following. <coughs> so next, uh, I don't know if I'm putting it very well, but let me. <coughs> the main thing, I, the real thing I want to say is the following. <coughs> Sorry, it's uh, intersectional. So the consequence is the following uh, of this discussion is the following, it says the following, the Lie algebra G of G breaks up into a direct product of the center C of G 
and bracket g g. So, <coughs> that is a statement I want to make now. The idea is this, this you look at, we got the mapping from, uh, yeah, the maybe the Let me put it like this. First note, let us look at the let add look at the adjoint representation, consider add which goes from G to G L of G. It is a real vector space because our V group is a com is a real A group. You have this adjoint representation and when one knows there exists a bilinear form, a non a, yes, uh, an inner product on GLG on, on G invariant under the adjoint of the invariant of the group at G, which is equivalent to saying. The product, let me give it a name. Now, under RG, <coughs> then yeah, let. C perp be the set of vectors V in G, V is orthogonal to every vector in C. Then we know that uh, G is nothing but C perp direct sum G, <coughs> direct sum of G prime, the orthogonal complement. Sorry, C perp. Now I claim that C perp is precisely bracket GG. <coughs> Why is this? You take any bracket XY x y in g, we want to claim that x y z is 0 if and only if x y z is 0 if and only if z is in the center. The reason is this, the invariance implies x, y, z equals x, y, z. Yeah. See, invariance under real algebra action means the following. You say that on the vector space of representation rho of g, then you and our inner product on v, you say this is g invariant if for every x, every x in g and v w in v, you have x v w plus v x w equal to 0 and I am applying it to the adjoint representation add to the real algebra which is add x on y is bracket x y you find that this is true <coughs> and then what happens 
So if uh, bracket x y z is 0 for every pair x y would mean x is orthogonal to bracket y z with y, bracket y z is orthogonal to x for every x but that means this form is uh, inner product is orthogonal to this element is orthogonal to every element in the Lie algebra so that would mean y z is 0 so z is central and the thing is reversible you find that bracket something is in the orthogonal to the entire center if and only bracket x y if it is the form if, if it is the element in bracket g g that is that is the way it looks. So the Lie algebra g of g breaks up into a direct product of the center c and bracket the commutator uh, algebra Lie algebra. <coughs> now all this tells you that let us look at that uh, representation which, which we defined the <coughs> representation pi alpha I we defined from G to product of circles is one I put n copies. And this induces, let me call this representation something rho, then rho dot is a map of g into product of real line several copies and copies. <coughs> the kernel, yeah. One checks easily that the kernel, and you, if you fix a rep fix a in fixing an invariant product, you can easily see kernel rho dot is same as orthogonal complement of uh, <coughs> orthogonal complement of the center of C. But this is the Lie algebra of kernel rho. Kernel of rho dot is nothing but the Lie algebra of kernel of rho, and this is <coughs> so to see those is equal to bracket G G. So we find Lie algebra of kernel of rho is bracket G G. Kernel of rho is a compact sub subgroup with bracket GG as its Lie algebra. So what happens is this and if you look at the identity connected component G prime 0 of G prime that is a compact connected Lie group a finite index in G prime. And <coughs> so it's it's Lie algebra we know is bracket GG. So you find all from which you conclude that first of all uh, the, the, the group G itself is uh, the center times G prime. G prime zero. So the compact Lie group G breaks up into a product center times G prime zero. Moreover, C prime intersection G prime zero is finite. 
Why? Because G prime is the kernel of that representation row. G prime is by definition the represent, kernel of the representation row. <coughs> so you find that C prime intersection G prime 0 is finite. So implies G is a, an almost direct product. of C, not C, what did I write C prime for? The C prime is the connected component I called it, is it? Where is C? <laughs> I have lost track of C here. C center of G. Hmm? Sorry? Earlier you had defined C and center of C. Center of C though, so I should write C naught. C is center of G and C not the identity connected component. So any compactly group is therefore a semi-direct product of uh, <coughs> it is an almost direct product of C0, yeah G C0 times G prime 0 where G is an uh, almost direct product and moreover <coughs> and the of, of C naught and G prime naught. Further, you also have the fact that center of G prime naught is finite. See, the point is that the representation rho we defined there is faithful on the center and anything in the center of G prime naught is also in the center of G because G itself is C naught G naught anything in the center of G, G prime naught is going to be is going to co co commute with G. So the upshot is that any compactly group is the direct product of a Of a, of a torus, this is a connected abelian D group, therefore it is a torus of a torus and a normal direct product of a torus and the group G prime, connected group G prime naught which is which, which has, which, which has uh, finite center. So that is the The upshot is the following G connected compactly group and then and see its center. C not identity connected component C. Then there exists a compact connected normal, normal because it is a the group is seen to be the kernel of this, the identity connected component or the kernel of kernel of any home morphism is obviously a normal subgroup and then I take the connected component that will be normal again. <coughs> so a compact connected normal subgroup H with finite center. such that finite center uh, <coughs> such that G equals C intersection sorry C times H with C intersection H equal to center of 
Oh, no, this can, sorry, I should say uh, C intersection H. Yeah, the center of H. <coughs> okay, so that is the statement. So in particular, it follows that uh, C itself. Oh, C not is what I said here. So C not. C not H with C not intersection H. The center itself and in fact the center C itself C not times oh no sorry so C not is contain the center of H. And C itself equals C not times center of H. Center of H may be bigger than C naught intersection H <coughs> can happen. Okay, so this is the in some sense the first structure result in the sense that any compact group the group has been broken up into a compactly group it's, sorry a, a torus this C naught is the torus. It is a product of a torus and <coughs> another group which is only finite center, connected group which is only finite center. So that is all I am going to say today. I am sorry this I am not probably been not so clear this time, but you can work it out. The details are not uh, difficult to see. If you noted down the theorems then <coughs> you can work out the details. It turns out actually that uh, the subgroup H here is actually the commutator subgroup of G. It is uh, it is easy to see that it is the closer of the commutator subgroup, but the commutator subgroup itself is closed that is the group generated by commutators turns out to be closed. The proof of that comes out of the fact that the set of, set of commutators itself will be an open neighborhood of the identity it contains some open set and then it is clear that any so the set of competence will open subgroup and open subgroup is closed that is that is the one proofs. <coughs> okay. <coughs>